Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender, where we take that deep dive into the most important economic issues facing agriculture. I'm your host, Carly Jacobson. David Widmar and Brent Gloy are back with us from Agricultural Economic Insights, along with our own lender expert, Mary Liz Stutz, a financial officer out of Huron, South Dakota. So I really love today's topic because it shines a light on the cause behind the irritation you might experience when someone tells you to know your numbers. And depending on who's asking, maybe it's your accountant, your financial officer, or even your spouse, they're likely talking about different types of costs or numbers. So let's talk about it. Let's dig into that. Um, Before we do that, though, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Utilize those Q&A bubbles at the bottom of your Zoom window to get your questions submitted to our experts. Also, we will have a poll again today during today's webinar, so stay close to your mouse so you can participate in that. So Brent, you know I like this topic, but let's back up just a little bit further. Tell us about your perspective about knowing your costs. Thanks, Carly. It is great to be back again this week. Uh, It is hard to believe that we are almost through July. Uh, things are, summer is really flying by. And uh, so I want to welcome everybody back again and talk about what I would say is probably my greatest pet peeve uh, is that when people say, give that pad advice of know your costs. And uh, there's a reason I say that because I think this is probably the most common advice that anybody, that, that people get, uh, know your costs. And there's a good reason for that. There's good reasons why we want to know our costs. It helps us make better decisions. It helps us make better marketing decisions. It can help us plan our capital expenditures. It can help us plan our growth, understand whether we can grow our farm business or or, uh, what we need to do to uh, do better as we grow our farm business. It takes a lot of the emotions out of our decision-making. But the reason that this annoys me so much is because nobody ever talks about exactly what kinds of costs uh, they're talking about. And, you know, there's there's a lot of, and, and, and the, the reason this is so important is because we've thought of at least three different types of costs. You have accounting costs, you have cash flow costs, and you have economic costs of production. All three of those are very different concepts. All three are important, okay? But they're they're very different and they can lead to very differing answers and very differing uh, recommendations about what to do. And so when somebody says know your costs, it's not really um, very helpful in the sense that It isn't really telling you exactly what they're talking about. And I want to know exactly which kind of cost we're talking about. So let's dig into that a little bit. Three ways to measure your costs. you got accounting, and we want to make accrual adjusted costs. And and those are going to include depreciation on our equipment. And accrual adjustment just means that we take our cash expenses and we adjust them for changes in inventories. So, for instance, if this year we buy a lot more prepays than we did in the past year. Um, that would, if you, if you don't recognize that in the following year, you're going to, it's going to look like you have really good costs the next year because you paid for all your expenses in the previous year. And so we just want to go ahead and adjust, make those accrual adjustments. And that, so that's accounting costs are, are important and they're very useful. Then there's cash flow costs and, and in particular cash outflows. And these are really important as well. And these are kind of all of your out-of-pocket expenses, the inputs that you, you purchase, the rent you pay, the debt service that you have, both principal and interest, uh, your family living expenses. So kind of all of those cash flows that we accrue over the course of the year. Also a very important concept. If we run out of cash, um, it can cause cause some stress. Okay, so cash flow is an important cost to measure as well. And then there are economic costs, and those are you know we're economists, um, and so this is you know a, what we what we tend to think of as the true cost of production. And that's the cost of all the resources that you use to grow a crop or raise an animal, uh, includes economic depreciation, uh, all the inputs we use, the labor we use, the management in, in, a, in our real estate that we own, but wouldn't include things like principal payments. So the other big thing with economic costs is that's economic depreciation, not 
not accounting depreciation or tax depreciation, which could be, you know, we can we can buy that new tractor and write it all off in one year. Uh, we didn't use it up as an, as an economic depreciation. We want to understand, you know, we would charge the amount that you used up during the year. So again, not to say any one of these concepts is unimportant. They're all important, but they're all costs and they all can vary significantly from farm to farm. And if you don't, you know, you know it's important to know all these. And Brent, to jump in a little bit, I think producers can and listeners today can probably relate to some of the frustration or confusion that they feel when they might sit down with an accountant who's helping them prepare maybe their schedule F for their taxes, and it comes out with one piece of information. And then they go uh, meet with their lender, and they, they need to consider, you know, the outlook might be a little bit different once they sit down with their lender and they start accounting for family living or debt service. And they might go to a meeting where they have an economic cost of production. And none of these numbers are ever going to be identical. And what the point is that really great farm managers need to think about their costs in sort of all three buckets. We need to think about the implications of all three of these, especially as we go to make decisions. So we wanted to uh, take a moment here to ask a little poll. And the poll question is, is for a typical farm, which cost measure do you think is highest? And so Brent outlaid the, the three alternatives, accounting, cash flow, and economics. You know, David, maybe this is, I'm sensitive to this, but uh, I, you know, it, it is always annoying to me when, when people apply that you don't know your costs. You know, I, I always say I, farmer, farmers know the costs. You just, they, they know the costs that they're focused on, but it's really important to kind of get a hold of all of these. And that it's, creates a lot of difference of opinion. Okay, and if we see the results here, split mostly between cash flow and economic accounting being the lowest. So inter interesting. The truth is, David, there's no right answer here because it just depends on their situation. So we can make any of those higher or lower depending on depending on the situation. Right. And so for the rest of Brent and I's session here, we want to provide a few examples to help you really think about this and be able to go back to your operation and dive into this. So so, so they were they were all right, David. Were, it's just like my class. Everybody got an A. Always, I always ask questions. Everybody could I'll get them all right. You all got them right. Yep, <laughs> yeah. And, and we'll actually explain how how this can how this is the case. So I want to start up with a little bit of an example, and the example is sort of this hypothetical farm at the end of this long county road, and there's two neighbors, right? Two farms that are across the street from each other, and for most of us driving by. They look identical from, from the road. They both farm 2,500 acres. Farm number one rents all those acres and farm number two owns all their acres. How do these different cost measures play out on their operation? How do these actually work their way into their, into their financial statements or into their decision-making? Well, let's look at each of these at one at a time. First is accounting costs. So farm number one is going to have $175 per acre, the rental charge, uh, as an accounting cost. They're going to have to, to pay that. But farm number two uh, isn't going to have an accounting expense here. They're, they own that asset. They're not uh, paying to use it. So they're not going to have an expense there. Now we move down to cash flow. Again, farm number one is going to have $175 an acre in a cash outflow. They're going to have to see cash go out the door every year to cover the rent for that. Now, farm number two, this is where it gets really interesting. It depends on the debt structure. If they own the farm outright, you know, free and clear, they would have zero cash outflows for, for this. But on the other hand, if they just recently bought that farm and they have a, a short um, window to repay that in a pretty aggressive repayment structure, their cash outflow on an annual basis could be more than $175 an acre. So it really depends on that debt structure. And finally, we get to the economic costs and the true economic costs for this example that we put together is both of these farms have $175 an acre in economic costs. And so this is a bit of an example to help you think about it. And again, driving down the road, these farms are going to look, maybe they look identical, but how they're structured here really impacts which one of these is more as they, as they move through there. And it's the cash flow for this example that we really see the difference as well as the accounting. Now, this is one example. And as we uh, we put together a handout that's going to be in the email, 
And this is sort of a, a little bit of a workflow chart that you can look at. And we broke down the, the different treatments for various costs, um, for the various cost measures for, for several ways of thinking about that. And so we're not going to spend our time today really breaking all this down, but this is just a way for you to take this worksheet and start thinking about it on your operation. And just like the land that we just talked about, um, it all has a little bit of a different impact. And the reason why it's significant to think about this is it impacts the decisions that we can make from that. So um, again, we're going to yeah. include that chart in the handouts uh, that we're going to email you later on. And David, I think if you look at this chart, these are some of the sources of the greatest amounts of confusion as the, in terms of the advice that people get. I'll say, well, your costs are high because your family li and family living is high. Well, some measures don't even account for family living and some do. So they're, they're, I mean, you get into these just situations where it can be really confusing. And uh, I think this is a good way to kind of lay that out. But the biggest sources on this chart are usually probably in machinery and land. Uh, it's going to influence, you know, those costs uh, the most. So someone have really low cash, cash flow costs, really high uh, economic costs and, and vice versa. So, so here's, here's another way to think about that and how to think about making decisions. And so, you know, what we want to do is let's, let's say we've got a decision point today and we've got a price uh, here on the left of your screen. And as you go through time, we're going to have a lot of uncertainty and that the market is, uh, you know, going through that period of, you know, we're, we're, not at peak uncertainty anymore, but there's a lot of uncertainty and prices could go, you know, higher, you know, or lower, but we have a price today. And our, our decision today is do we sell, you know, commodity today or not? And a lot of times as we, as we think about that, we will want to, people say, well, what's your cost of production? And so, you know, here, here is uh, how that might lay out on there. So if we go to the next slide, we can see here's a farm that has cash flow costs here. And I've ordered these as, you know, red, yellow, accounting, and economic costs green. And Dave and I had a, a little bit of a debate about how to order these costs. And I ordered them uh, in terms of cash flow being, you know, costs that are absolutely critical. You know, if we want to cover our cash flows, we've got to have a price. And you see the price today would be above our cash flow costs. Um, the accounting costs may be a little bit higher and then economic costs being the highest of those. And so one of the questions you ask yourselves is do you sell today? What costs are you co covering? And th this example, of course, would be for a farm that doesn't have very much debt. Uh, so it doesn't have much debt service or family living obligations. So it's cash flow costs are really low. Uh, and I always say, you know, if I can sell above my economic costs over the long run, I'm going to do quite well. But we've also got to remember that that's not the situation for everybody. Okay. Sometimes these cash flow costs can be a lot higher. So let's just take those two scenarios here. This is the farm here on the left that, that I talked about on the last side, low debt service, low family living obligations. That current price is covering the cash flow costs. What are the implications of selling there? Well, they're not going to cover all their costs. They're not hitting the economic costs, but they're they're not eroding their working capital. Um, it, there's benefits to selling. If you get below that cash flow cost, that's mm, tough. Now, on the other hand, consider a farm whose costs line up more like this. Here's a farm that has a lot of debt service, family living, uh, and a lot of tax depreciation. Their economic costs are quite low. This price is well above their economic cost of production, which is really a good time. You know, if, if you're covering that economic cost, the full cost of economic costs, you're, you're making a true economic profit. That's a good thing. But their cash flow needs are, are even higher. And so what are, what are the implications here? Well, we're profitable, but we're not profitable enough to cover all those cash flows and we'll see some working capital erosion. They really need that price to be a little higher. Now, here's the alternative, though. If this is the situation, one has to ask, are there things we could do to structure that 
cash flow costs, you know, the really high debt service by maybe lengthening term that would reduce those cash flow costs. So when economic profits occur, we can sell. So this is this farm with a situation where I think it would warrant some further, you know, a deep dive into kind of their financial situation, David. Yeah, I think what this really helps us think about is a lot of times there isn't this black and white, you know, are my costs of production lower than the current commodity price? If yes, sell. If no, wait. Um, Because in a lot of cases, that if no wait, that isn't uh, an ideal situation, especially if the waiting doesn't give us a higher price. And so if we can break these costs into the different in the different buckets, in the different ways of thinking about it, we might be in a scenario where we're looking at the farm on the, on the left side of the screen is this isn't the best situation, but I can make a decision today and I can, you know, very likely stay in business for another year. I can keep treading water. This isn't a doomsday scenario. And I think that's what we really have to think about is, is sometimes the long run versus the short run. And to the farm on the, on the right, this example here, in the long run, they have this opportunity to maybe restructure their their cash flows in a way that get them in a situation where they that cash flow cost is a little more serviceable. That's a little more manageable. So this exercise, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard, but it's going to allow you to think about this in, in, with a lot more dimensions. You can really start to look at it. And it's not black and white anymore, but it's more shades of of how confident you are to make decisions today. Right. And I think it's really important because, you know, you hear someone say, well, sell above your cost. Well, you, you can be in a situation where the cash flow costs are really low and yeah, you're covering them all, you're selling all, but you're not making an economic profit. And maybe you need to, need to think about whether that selling price target is the right one. Um, so it's really important, I think, to just dig in and really understand the relationship and your operation is where are these costs at and what are the various costs in in your business and what are you trying to achieve in the long run? We have some final thoughts. And the first one is really a challenge for you to, to go home and work on this a little bit is know your cost structure and which is the highest for your operation and really think about, think about this in in ways that you can continue to dial that in and get even more insights and, and more actionable information when you go to make decisions. The second point is, how often can you cover all three of these costs? And in a year like 2021, a lot of us, if not all of us, will be able to probably make economic profits and cover our cash flow and cover our accounting costs. But that isn't the case for every year. And we have to make decisions in some years where we know there's not a great outcome. And so we have to know all these different costs and the implications of only covering some of those and how that impacts our operation down the road. And this brings us to the third point, short term versus long term. And what adjustments can you make, especially in 2021, with some of the opportunities that we've been presented with a strong profitable outlook that will help you make uh, some long term adjustments that can help you improve. And finally, Brent and I talked about three costs here, but you can very easily include a fourth line, which include your goals. And so you can start to say, I have this goal to build my working capital, or I have a goal to to pay off this debt a little faster or grow my operation and buy this farm down the road. I need to get this down payment in place for that. Identify your goals and you can start to move those goals and you can translate those into something that's actionable. Kind of that idea of, uh, of a uh, SMART goal, the, the S-M-A-R-T, that acronym, this can start to become a, a, a tangible thing that you can move towards. And now you can move that into that, into that description that we've added. So you can have a fourth line there. Of, can I, this price that I'm looking at today, does that allow me to achieve the goals that I'm trying to move forward? And in a year like 2021, that can take some of the pressure off. Like, okay, I'm covering my economic, my accounting, my cash flow, and I'm going to make a lot of progress towards my farm's long-term goals. That makes some of these marketing decisions a lot more, uh, a lot less stressful, I guess, a lot more um, pleasant for us to sort through. If you're sitting here going, well, I don't know any of these costs in my operation, Go sit down with your farm credit uh, lending officer and and work through some of these uh, and start to dig into it. You don't have to jump to the moon today. Just get started on it. And uh, a little bit of stepping and understanding how those cost relationships play out in your business can go a long, long way toward helping you manage your farm better. And 
you know, we've got a nice library of webinars up and we cover some of these topics like the economic depreciation and other things in, in those webinars. I encourage you to go back and take a look at it. But, you know, really, you know, know your costs, but but know which costs we're talk, you're talking about and which ones are most important to you. And especially for the decisions you're making, right? Because they're important to you, but the different decisions can require different, uh, different measures. So it's it's my pleasure now to invite Mary Liz to the to the digital stage here as our lender expert for this month, and it's been great to work with Mary Liz preparing for this webinar today. So first off, thank you, welcome, Mary Liz. Can you get us kick us off here by telling us a little bit more about yourself? Okay, I grew up in an implement dealership. I am married, and we have. 800 ewes and six kids and two grandkids. So a very diverse operation. And as we lamb in three different groups for different markets. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. And I look forward to you sharing all your expertise with from the personal side, but from all the, the operations you've worked with throughout your career. So the first question that I have for you is, You've worked with hundreds of farmers uh, throughout your career. What are some of the best practices that you've seen for producers managing and knowing their costs? The best practice is the producer who consistently uses their books, and this includes production. They don't wait until the end of the year when they have to do their taxes or meet with their their financial officer to do the renewal. Yeah, that that's a really great piece of advice. I remember an econ professor used to say, do you have an elephant or a bread box? And I think the idea is accounting can sometimes be an elephant. You got to take it one bite at a time and you don't want to wait to try to do it all on December 31st. So that's a really great piece of advice. And as for someone who stayed up late on December 31st from time to time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's just like studying, right? Cramming works, but it's not really the best way to do it. And I always, I have this little thing on my office right here. It says, you know, uh, the sooner you act, the higher the returns. And so I think that's pretty good advice. So just a bit of a follow-up to that first question is it's easy for us to say, work on your books right now, right? But, or have a good set of records in place, but that's an investment of time and and maybe some resources and they're not insignificant. So what are some of the benefits? What's the ROI there? What are some of the benefits that producers who deploy those implement, deploy those practices can, can benefit from? Well, it allows them to be proactive instead of reactive. And there's always changes in agriculture. So you need to be ready to act. Um, It allows you to maximize the tools you have available to you, be it your insurance agents, your accountant, that person at FSA that keeps you up to date on the government programs, the person that helps you market your end product. And allows you to take more control of your operation in the world where you think you're not in control. You're not being pushed into making decisions. You're making informed decisions. That's very, very good. So we've talked a lot about, you know, the value of knowing your costs in in that exercise, but what happens if we mess it up? What happens if we really don't know our costs or don't know, or don't get a handle on all the costs that are relevant? Um, you're not going to be able to maximize your profit or cut your losses. So you're going to have lost opportunities. You're not using your assets to the best of your ability. And don't forget, as you'd said, time is an asset. So you want to make sure you're using your time right. And you want to be ready to adjust. If the years 19, 2019 through 2021 didn't show you that you need to be ready to adjust and make smart decisions, I don't know what years wouldn't prove it best to you as programs kept changing and things just kept getting thrown at you. You really need to be ready to adjust. Um, One other thing I want to follow up here on is we talked a little bit about this, but what happens if the schedule F says you're profitable, but you know, you're not really covering everything. You're not getting all your, not enough money at the end of the schedule F, so to speak. Well, we talk about that every year with people. The Schedule F does not include your family living. I cannot stress that enough. And it does not include your principal payments. So when you think you're mitigating your tax obligations by purchasing a piece of equipment or something, you're not taking into consideration what that does to your cash flow and your working capital. It can really strain your cash flow 
or deplete your working capital, which can create economic losses and keeping you from reaching your end goals. Remember, your accountant doesn't talk to your financial officer and your financial officer doesn't talk to your accountant. So you need to be the one communicating between the two of them. And earlier is better than later. Now, um, I like the idea that Rome wasn't built in a day for this for this next question, but you know, this is can be hard work. What's one piece of advice that you'd share with a producer who really wants to step off in the direction, wants to roll their sleeves up? How can they get started on this journey or on this path towards um, being a better manager in this area? Don't wait until next year to start. Start now. Start using those records, looking at the numbers. Be honest with yourself with what those numbers are telling you. Um, especially for everybody in the drought areas, there are going to be programs coming at you. You may have to make some decisions about, do I buy hay? Do I sell my livestock? And you need to be talking to your accountant about that. They have rules that will help you through that. And that will help you with cash flow and economic decisions. You need to start at the beginning. You know, don't try to do all of them at once. Start with the cash flow, work up to the accounting and then do the economic. Well, that's, that's really valuable there. To reiterate what you said, sometimes cash flows maybe might be more intuitive, right? And the accounting, we can build that as a stepping stone. So with the cash flow, it might be more intuitive for a lot of listeners and then move on to the, the um, accounting and then on to the economic. As economists, I think about it the other way, but I guess folks just have to think about which are they most intuitive with and start there and then let it build out from, from there. Yeah. Um, I, th- I mean, I think it's, that works because partly, you know, that's the one you have to, I mean, you're paying the bills. So it, it, it starts, but it can be very misleading too. So it's important to do all, all of them. Yeah. So Mary Liz, I have a couple questions for you. The first one is a bit, I'm going to tee this up for you. You had a story that I would like you to share is about knowing your cost and insurance and fire. And, and this was an <laughs> unintuitive way that these two things are related, but share the story real quick with us, please. Okay. When my husband and I got married, he was kind of excited, you know, someone to help him with the books, has egg background, and even in lending. So he thought that was going to be great. You notice I said thought that was going to be great. <laughs> so me being me, I start going through everything and I'm like, you know, you haven't reviewed your farm insurance in a long time. And like a lot of people, oh, I hate reviewing my insurance. The only thing they do is charge you more. It's like throwing money out the window. The argument goes, and I just kind of walk away and like, you know, are you overpaying or are you underinsured? And this goes back and forth and back and forth. And he finally caves to nagging wife and he has his farm insurance reviewed. And he had done a lot of work on the place and he'd retend a barn, put a new roof on, etc. So yeah, he was underinsured and we increased the insurance. The premium went up and grumbles about it. Well, 12 weeks later with a barn full of, oh, we had what, 900 square bales up there of alfalfa and straw. And he had parked the farm truck in there. And of course it had fuel tanks on the back of it. One diesel, one gas, he left the keys in the ignition. Poor connection on that ignition. It starts to smolder. Nobody's looking at the truck every day and the cab of the truck catches on fire. Hot enough, it blows out the window. Then it explodes on the, f- the fuel catches on fire. It explodes 900 bales up there. It just went up in flames and it burned to the ground before the fire department could even make that there. So when you're all done and said, we're looking at how do we replace this barn? You know, what is going to be the best replacement in the long term, which would be your economic cost. And then there's your accounting cost, because this happened in November. So we're going to start getting money from the insurance company, but we're not going to get the replacement up until next year sometime. And then there's the cash flow cost, because what is insurance going to cover? What isn't insurance going to cover? And what there's always something you want to tweak with the barn. So we had to look at all of those things. And had we not looked at, you know, in the cash flow, yes, we increased ex- an expense, but the economic loss that we could have had would have been much more severe than the increase of that insurance expense. And going to end the story a little bit with, don't ever be afraid to make a videotape of your fire. 
I thought, why are you doing this as I was doing it? But notice we doubled the insurance 12 weeks before the fire. So when the arsonist specialist showed up and I hand my phone to him and he looks at it, he's, oh, this is great video. I see everything. Nope, this was an arson. This is legit, you know, and it, it really helped get those payments going. And then I have a little extra shout out to the Egg employees who were on the other side of the barn. Thank you for opening the gates and letting our sheep out. Yeah, well, that's that's appreciate you sharing that story. And it's it's a stressful story and it's stressful to live through. But again, an example of where spending some time getting ahead of this really helped you navigate that that challenging situation. So one of the things that's really important for managers is how do we move from data, which is often can be overwhelming and data on its own isn't necessarily valuable. It's how we process that data and how we move it uh, into knowledge and then eventually insights and finally implications so we can make ultimately decisions. And I think this is a lot about what we were talking about today. This is sort of the uh, uh, academic or theoretical way of thinking about it is you have all this transaction data that happens on your farm and the financial uh, aspect, but how do you move this through? And we can really get ourselves in a little bit of trouble if we get down to this implication and action items if we don't have the right information. So if we're trying to make um, debt decisions with economic costs of production, that's going to get us in trouble. So there's an article that you can really dive into this. Uh, it's a little more broad, but I think it'll help you think a little bit more about this at the, the 30 or 60,000 foot level. So with that, uh, we'll go back to the, the Q&A. So Brent, uh, what do we have in the hopper? Yeah. Uh... Good stuff. We're always trying to give people things that you know make make you better, make you um, think um, more clearly about your business. And we have a couple of really good questions. So, um, have one that says we've only been tracking our costs in great detail for a couple of years. Is that really enough to see the big picture and make important decisions, or is this more of a thing we should take some more time? and use that baby step approach. And so, um, great question. So first of all, one of, one of the things I would say is when you said we've only been doing it for two years, you've, you've been doing it for two years. That's great. Uh, you know, r really good that you're, you're working on it uh, for a couple of years. And I think you should be able to start to see that big picture come into focus uh, a little bit. Um, and I would ask you, you know, kind of flip it the other way and say, well, you're probably going to make big decisions. You, you were going to make big decisions before you had this information. Do you think this information is going to lead you to make a worse decision? And, and I think probably not. Uh, if you're doing a good job of keeping track of that data and organizing it. Um, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's important to have, you know, good data and, and data that's accurate to make those decisions. But usually having that is going to help you make a better decision than you would have otherwise. So, so I think, you know, one, yes, it's true. I think it can only help. Now, the other, the other one kind of feeds into this and says, what can we do with those yearly production of financial numbers? We can, we compile, we, we collect a lot of data, but what on earth can we do with it? And I think that's another great question because, you know, we do, we collect a lot of information in the, in the farm business and businesses today in general. And I would say, you know, the vast majority of it is not used very much at all. Uh, maybe file some taxes with it and give it a glance, but we don't regularly use it. And what, what I would say is, um, yeah, the, there's two real simple ways to use your kind of annual financial data. And the, the first is to compare yourself over time and take that trend look at, at your business over time. How is it? How are things trending? And that's kind of benchmarking against yourself. The other, the other thing is to, to see if you can benchmark against some other people. And so whether that's a farm business record keeping association or even with your um, financial services officer at farm credit, I think that's a great thing to take it in and say, Hey, um, how, how do these numbers compare with, with other things you're seeing? Let's have a good robust discussion about 
our finances. Um, the other thing that I think is useful is putting those numbers down even quarterly and having a regular business meeting where you discuss your financial situation and your financial progress. And, and you will be surprised as to how powerful that can be, uh, even even though it's, it's not something we do a lot in farm families, because it's kind of a family deal, and we don't like to sometimes don't feel comfortable doing that. But you have a lot of knowledge around that table that you you work with and that you live with, and having a structured meeting where you look at it and explain them and and discuss them can be super super powerful and i think richard feynman is a famous physicist uh, always you know he's a genius uh, but what he always said is you know the way to really learn a hard concept is to be able to teach it to somebody and so i think having that discussion makes you dig into the numbers more yourself i don't know other things david and uh, Mary Liz, I, I, I went on for probably too long there. Sorry. Well, I think of it as, as if you use that information, you decide what your business plan is for the next year, just because you keep doing, you've done this and done this and done this. Maybe that's not the best thing to be doing. You know, maybe you need to switch up your rotation. Maybe you need to be selling your calves at a different time. Maybe there's a better ration you could be feeding. And that's something you can do with that data. Thinking back to the the table I just shared, the idea of going from data to action, um, one thing that you can use this these data, these financial data for, is to say, what are the questions that we're trying to answer as a as an operation? What are the questions that we're trying to answer as as a family as we're thinking about this? And so, what are your goals? And so, are your goals attainable given the financial data that you have, or how can you make those goals more attainable? How can you achieve those goals? Uh, another one that you might ask is, you know, can we afford to buy this piece of farmland or can we um, justify bringing on another partner or another a generation into this? And so let your questions in a way guide how you're using some of these financial records, some of the data and some of the knowledge or insights that you've captured from this. And, and don't be frustrated if you can't answer the question immediately or you can't answer the question this year we need to use all this data in a way that benefits the questions and the questions we have for the operation. And it might take us some time to, to course correct or to change our processes to make sure that we can answer those questions in the future. So um, the answers might not be initially obvious, but we can work towards those down the road. And we're always going to be changing that, that data, knowledge, insights, implications, and actions uh, throughout our career. Those, that's kind of a, ever changing, always evolving. And even that by itself could be valuable to capture, right? What were the questions we tried to answer in, in 2020? What are the questions we're trying to answer in 2021? If you see some themes, you can really devote some effort into that. And then maybe 10 years from now, you can look back and laugh, say, wow, we were trying to figure out this. And now that's, that's obvious or that's not relevant to us anymore. So you can see part of the growth there. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Um, follow on to that question of saying, well, what's a bullet list or a list of agenda items for some of these kind of meetings and things that you, you would suggest. And, um, I'll just give you my kind of quick take on it. And there's about a million ways you can, you can organize this and, and put it together. But in, in my experience, one of the things, you know, as you think about those meetings, what you want to think about, at least in my, my situation, is say, you start off with something like risk management, set them up into kind of buckets. Okay, here's here's a risk management. It might be, you know, this month there's nothing new to report or nothing new to do, but this is where you would cover maybe, you know, Mary Liz's example about her insurance or, or whatever, uh, where you'd, you'd hit some of those items. Uh, personnel, so if you have any employees or not. Um, and talk about any issues there or things you need to do. And then probably marketing, uh, on a farm. Um, how's the marketing plan going? Where, you know, where are you at in it? Um, you know, has it been developed? Do you need to work on it? Who's working on it? Uh, operations, uh, production type things, you know, issues or things you need to do, uh, financial, uh, would then be a whole nother 
set section where you maybe go over some finances and, and discuss it. And then probably maybe a strategy section. And obviously each of those can kind of be, you know, expand or contracted based on when the meeting is and, and what really important, but you've kind of got that list of risk management, personnel, financial, marketing, operations, strategy, a way to kind of work through systematically your business and, and have a really good discussion in it. This this might be a topic worth doing a whole new a future episode about. I think it's really valuable that Brent, what you share. I think the other thing is, is think about how you want to communicate this information. So you want to maybe communicate with your partners and your family members, you know, this is when we're going to have the meeting. These are the topics that we're going to talk about during this meeting. This is maybe in, it might be structured or unstructured, but you need to tell them sort of upfront. And maybe there's information that you can share that you want them to read or review, or maybe there's financial statements that you want to share ahead of time. But I think a lot of it is sort of developing a, a routine or a culture or maybe even habits around how you're going to go about doing this. And so the one thing you want to avoid is sort of surprises or you want to avoid big shocks or adjustments to the system. You you want to, I guess, over communicate and over plan this a little bit, especially in the first few iterations to make sure everyone's on the same page and they know what the outcomes or the, the intended outcomes are. Yeah, I'm the king of that. I'm not very good at that. I have all these grand plans in my head and just kind of dump it on people all at once and then they're overwhelmed and it's a disaster. So David's always good to give that advice and think about how to how to uh, layer that in. Um, so another question, if your farm pays everyone's salary, do you really need to account for it in family living? And here again, I, w- I, I would say, you know, Part of this comes down to what what is the question you're trying to answer. Um, it's good that you're paying people a salary. I guess it depends, I suppose, a little bit on how much is the salary. Is it you know enough to support their family? Can they take family living draws on top of that or not? Uh, if if you know it, it kind of, it kind of depends. But I think it's good that you're you know you're at least accounting for paying that salary to start with. Um, in terms of the cash flow, if they're not taking other draws, no, you've already covered that. Uh, so you wouldn't need to, wouldn't need to uh, include it again um, from, from my perspective. But um, so there's, there's, it's a little hard to answer that specifically, but uh, that's, that's the way I would say it. Well, you can also look at it is it meeting that family's, like you said, the salary meeting that family's financial family living cost. Because if not, if you're doing a succession plan and stuff, is it going to keep those kids in the farm or are they going to be looking at other opportunities? And is the farm providing other family living costs? Because if the house is on the farm and the land's all paid for, there is a family living cost that is paid for, but not really record it. Well, I think that covers all the questions. Uh, feel free to jump in if I'm missing one. Of course, we did a family living uh, webinar web series a few months ago, so you can go find that in the archive. So it's interesting how we can have a conversation about a topic, but this one brings up a whole new set of questions. And so they're related, but very good questions to add on to that. So thank you so much, Carly. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Absolutely. So that'll do it for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender. So thank you, David, Brent, Mary Liz, for leading today's conversation. And all of you in the audience, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you online again next month.